Often thought of as by far the least important and least influential of his group, he played a crucial behind-the-scenes role in the war for Russia's musical identity. As a fierce defender of nationalistic music, despite not really ever writing any himself. Oh, and by the way, his day job was actually being a general. I'm the Classical Nerd, and today we're talking about Cesar Cui. When we think of Russian names, neither Cesar nor Cui come to mind. His full name was Caesarius Benjaminius Cui, which sounds downright Roman, and he was born to a French father and Lithuanian mother in Vilnius, the capital of present-day Lithuania, in January 1835. Cesar's brothers, Alexander and Napoleon. I'm sensing a theme here. He grew up quadrilingually, learning Russian, his father's French, his mother's Lithuanian, and Polish, since Poland and Lithuania were part of the same administrative district of the Russian Empire. This proximity to Poland and points further west introduced the young Cesar to the music of Frédéric Chopin, and he got a few lessons in piano and theory along the way. His sister was actually his first piano teacher, and his theory lessons lasted only several months. He also started writing his own music when he was 14, first copying out every single Chopin mazurka on his own staff paper because, well, they couldn't afford a collection of printed sheet music. And then he added his own mazurka, a piece in G minor. Chopin's signature genres would influence what Cui would write for the piano for the rest of his life. The young Cesar matriculated at St. Petersburg's Military Engineering School when he was only 16 years old, as he was pushed there by his father. There was only one piano at the entire school, and he rarely, if ever, could get free time on it to compose. He was never really able to compose away from a keyboard. After completing his training there, he entered the military and began teaching at various Russian military academies starting in 1857. All the while, he was a prolific composer and writer, with as many things to say in words as he did in tones. In 1856, he had first made the acquaintance of Mili Balakirev, who encouraged Kiwi's musical career as much as possible, and Kiwi became the first member of the group of four composers that would come under Balakirev's influence and eventually become known as the Mighty Handful, or the Five. 1859 saw Kiwi's first public performance when Anton Rubinstein conducted his Opus 1 Scherzo. This piece was based off his initials, as well as those of his wife's maiden name, Malvina Bamberg, whom he met through Alexander Dogomirsky an eventual leader to the other members of the Mighty Handful, after Balakirev became a little too dictatorial for their tastes. This practice of encoding ciphers into his music by hiding names in this way is not something that Kiwi often did, but he did it in at least two pieces, and it's probable that he picked up this practice from study of the music of Robert Schumann, who was one of the favorite composers of the Mighty Handful. In 1869, ten years after his first orchestral performance, Kiwi was the first member of the Mighty Handful to have an opera performed. Almost every member of the group had operatic aspirations, or in the case of Balakirev, had had operatic aspirations, but some were better than others at actually getting them written. This opera, William Ratcliffe, occupied Kiwi throughout the 1860s, and its gestation points to a camaraderie within the group. Balakirev had suggested the plot, a tragedy set in 1600 Scotland, and both he and Nikolai Rimsky-Korsakov had a hand in orchestrating parts of it, as Kiwi was never the best at that. Rimsky thought the whole thing could stand a little more reorchestration, but it was well received by fellow members of the handful who could occasionally be quite brutal to one another's works, especially Balakirev. This is especially surprising since the plot of Ratcliffe is far removed from the Russian nationalist themes that the group usually espoused. This wasn't his first opera that he wrote, but it was the first opera that he got performed, and getting an opera performed is a huge step in an operatic composer's career. Oftentimes you have to mess up on stage. You have to figure out firsthand what does and doesn't work before subsequent operas can actually be better pieces of music. That's the thing about operatic composition. It's very hard, almost impossible, to get it right on your first try. This is partially why Kevin Putz won the 2012 Pulitzer Prize for his opera Silent Night. It was his first opera, and it's pretty good. I went to the North Carolina premiere of it, not to brag or anything. Very, very good production. This is to say that this isn't a new phenomenon. This has always been the case that first operas are generally not very good. In the case of Huey, the first opera he had produced was not his first opera written, but it did give him a sense of what did and didn't work. Inevitably. For another composer, this might have been the start to a great operatic career, but Cui hampered himself because he had a tendency to be extremely hot-blooded in the press, which didn't gain him many friends. He poisoned the well for a great many people. 
Starting in 1864, he had started publishing his anonymous opinions in the St. Petersburg Gazette. His byline was three asterisks because regulations within the Russian military didn't allow officers to write things under their own name without specific permissions. However, it was not long before his identity was discovered. The Grand Duchess Elena Pavlovna, who had helped kick Balakirev out of the Russian Musical Society, got offended by some of the biting things QE wrote and figured out who was behind them. She was the aunt of Tsar Alexander II, so she had considerable clout. QE was hauled in front of his superior, General Eduard Totleben, who unsuccessfully ordered him to lay off the gas pedal. Well, they didn't have gas pedals, but you know. The difference between QE and the rest of the members of the handful was that QE was more willing to stick his neck out in the press for the things that they all believed in. This made his music a target, and after the eighth performance of William Ratcliffe, QE wrote a letter to the editor under his own name urging people not to go because he thought the production and the producer and the performers all were bad and were mangling the production. Despite lacking true anonymity, QE rarely, if ever, held back in his criticisms of people he didn't like, and he didn't like a lot of people. Sure, his friend and mentor Balakirev was no friend of Anton Rubinstein either, but it's conceivable that QE could have at least been on friendly terms with Rubinstein, but he too was attacked by QE's pen. He also discounted the music of a great many composers of the past in a manner that was not dissimilar to the way that Pierre Boulez would later claim that Schoenberg was dead and that the opera houses should be burned down. This riled up and galvanized the mighty handful's base of support, but did nothing to further their cause amongst the people who actually liked the Bachs and Mozarts and Beethovens of the world. This included the novelist Ivan Turgenev, who wrote in 1868 that Kiwi's empty head ought to be smashed in with a dirty brick. Leaving nothing to the imagination there. I love the fact that he had to specify that the brick was dirty. It's just great. I love insults. So, success at first wasn't necessarily to be expected, but no matter, QE continued to write operas. None of them very much success, but boy did this dude try. Only a handful of his 15 operas, only six of which were full length, were ever done outside the borders of the Russian Empire. And none of them managed to stick in the repertoire. So why? Well, there are many factors here, one of which being that it's hard to get any opera to stick in the repertoire. The second is that QE didn't have any friends because you need a lot of people on your side to be a successful opera composer and he had a tendency to get people frustrated at him because of the things he'd write in the press. All but one of his operas was originally written in Russian and the one that wasn't written in Russian was a French language comedy called Le Flibustier which had a run of four performances in the 1880s in France, which Kiwi referred to as a ruthless strangulation. Russian can be a very tricky language to set, especially if you're trying to do it naturalistically because of the way it handles stress. It doesn't get translated well into other languages. Additionally, unlike Modest Mussorgsky's Boris Godunov or many of Nikolai Rimsky-Korsakov's operas, Kiwi's subject matter often isn't nationalistically Russian. The music reflects this because Kiwi loved a lot of lyricism in his works, whereas, again, going back to Boris Godunov as sort of the preeminent example of the Russian style, that's very rough around the edges. It's over the top in some ways. It's incredibly dramatic. It has staying power because it's gripping and dramatic and also super Russian. It leans into those influences. Whereas QE said that well, at least one time that he didn't feel like he could write Russian music because he was French and Lithuanian at heart. It just wasn't in his nature. Aside from it just being in Russian, there isn't as much of a distinguishing factor that makes QE's operas stand out from an equivalent opera being written further west. Second, his full-length pieces are super full-length. His second opera that was ever performed is a piece called Angelo, and it took a whopping five hours at its premiere. And this isn't QE's fault either. The Marinsky Theater only did evening-long affairs, so shorter works had to be done outside Russia with smaller groups, or not at all. I do want to note that in his lifetime, he did achieve some success with a certain number of operas, although this was always limited. One of his most notable works is a piece called Prisoner of the Caucasus, based off a poem by Alexander Pushkin. This had a number of performances, at least 13 in QE's lifetime, including one in Liège in 1886, which was the first time a mighty handful opera was performed further west than the Russian Empire. This performance was facilitated by the Countess Louise of Merci en Gento, who ran across QE's Opus 8 No. 3 Polka in 1883 and began a correspondence with him. She was well connected to many big European names, including Franz Liszt and Camille Saint-Saëns, and she fell in love with Russian music so deeply that she learned Russian, translated several of the Mighty Handful's operas into French, organized concerts of their music, and played piano in these concerts. 
Huey and Alexander Bordadin had spent Christmas in 1885 at her Belgian estate. Also of note was his early comedy The Mandarin's Son. Huey would joke that royalties from that opera assisted his daughter Lydia, who had become a widow in 1915, but he also considered that piece a trifle and was almost embarrassed by it. Finally, there was his one-act opera Mademoiselle Fifi, which gained significant traction during World War I for its anti-German sentiments. However, whatever traction Huey's operas were beginning to generate was lost almost immediately after his death. The Russian Revolution certainly didn't help matters, as it upset the artistic front as much as the political and socioeconomic fronts. As a result of many of these factors, Huey's operas have rarely been performed after 1918, even the Mandarin Sun stopped production after 1921. During his life, he was part of various musical societies and even won an award from the Imperial Russian Music Society for a choral orchestral piece he wrote in 1860, so it wasn't that he was a bad composer. Kiwi believed strongly in music education and worked closely with the librettist Nadezhda Dolomanova on the set of children's operas late in his career. Like, there's not a real children's opera repertoire, there's only a handful of them, and trying to break into that is even harder than trying to break into the actual opera world. An exception could be made for his children's opera Puss in Boots, which got popular in East Germany during the 1980s and was put to disc in 1999. And there was a production of The Mandarin's Son in February 1998, where all the other male characters in that opera were reinterpreted as other members of the Mighty Handful, so it was kind of meta. He also wrote a ton of non-stage works aimed at children, first for his daughter Lydia and then for his grandson Yuri. These children's pieces were often used in the Soviet Union for music education, but languished in obscurity in the West. Basically, what I'm trying to say is it takes a lot to have a piece stay in the repertoire, and for some reason, almost none of his did. I'm being too kind. None of his did. It speaks more to operatic culture and his attitude than it does to the objective quality of his work. Other musicians were, in fact, quite impressed by it, including Franz Liszt, who was a huge fan of William Ratcliffe, and QE's Opus 12, Tarantella, has the dubious honor of being Liszt's final piano transcription, which is funny because most of QE's orchestral music was originally piano pieces that he orchestrated. QE wrote a lot of music, and it's hard to quantify who wrote more music because Rimsky-Korsakov was also quite prolific, and Balakadev, if you look at all his piano pieces, was also quite prolific. So I'm inclined to say that QE might have been the most prolific member of the Mighty Handful because operas Oh, there's a lot of man hours you're talking about, even if they're not evening-long productions. And while he did try to make his name in opera, he wrote a ton of songs, as well as piano music and chamber music. He and Borodin were perhaps the only two members of the group that took chamber music with any degree of seriousness. His Opus 50 No. 9, Oriental, is probably his most performed work, both in its original violin and piano incarnation, as well as various transcriptions. 
Curiously, he was never really into symphonic or concerto form. I do speculate that if he'd written a symphony or a concerto and that had become popular, it, it's possible that he may be better known as a composer today. QE's comrade in criticism and fellow proponent of Mighty Handful ideology, Vladimir Stasov, believed that QE's main gifts were in smaller forms, working with poetry, and dealing with the various facets of love. Stasov's ultimate take was that while Kiwi wasn't a Russian composer in the same way that more orchestrally inclined folk idiom loving contemporaries were, Kiwi had them beat in terms of depth of emotion. But objectively, analysts who have turned their pen towards the works of the Mighty Handful as a collection note that the Russian elements that crop up in the other members just as often crop up in Kiwi's music. The difference is that he had a different, more subtle way of expressing these things. It's a good thing then that he didn't try to make his living in music. His particular expertise was in military fortifications, and while a lot of this was based off of engineering principles, he did see some action during the 1870s during the Russo-Turkish War, when Russian forces defeated the Ottoman Empire partially in retribution for losses incurred during the Crimean War some two decades prior. This helped him achieve a professorship in 1880, and he was officially made a general by 1906. For Russian military students of this era, Huey's textbooks on fortifications were the go-to source. He literally wrote the book on military fortifications. Because he taught a lot of members of the Romanov dynasty, including the eventual final Tsar, he was incredibly close to the royal family, and his status as a general only augmented this. He wrote a cantata for the 300th anniversary of the dynasty in 1913, and his final opera, The Captain's Daughter, has overtly pro-monarchist themes. He had to petition Nicholas II, his former pupil, to grant an exemption to an 1837 edict that banned Romanov members from operatic portrayals. Kiwi was, additionally, a staunch advocate of equal rights, particularly disdainful of anti-Semitic attitudes which by 1901 had strained his relationship with his son, not to mention the increasingly anti-Semitic Balakidev. Kiwi died of a stroke in March 1918 at the age of 83. Ironically, despite being its least known and quite frankly least influential figure, Kiwi was the last of the mighty handful to die. By his final years, he had gone blind, and his attitudes towards modern music were downright polemical. Gone were the days of being on the cutting edge and railing against the people who wanted to hold music back. At this point, Kiwi was staunchly, staunchly conservative. In fact, he was criticizing the young futurist generation for, quote, being composers without first being musicians. His hundreds of contributions in the press between 1864 and 1918 cover almost every single musical topic imaginable from production values to historical contexts, and about three out of every eight were on opera. In the articles that were published in France and Belgium, he toned back his criticism and instead was a proponent of Russian music to a wider audience. But the problem here was that in, for instance, promoting Dogomishsky's The Stone Guest as a preeminent example of great Russian opera, Kiwi had to admit that in translation, what made this opera great was going to be lost. So tied in it was to the particular speech patterns of Russian as a language. Perhaps this is a clue as to why Kiwi's operatic ambitions weren't as overtly Russian. Perhaps he wanted a wider appeal. Mostly he was very supportive of his fellow Mighty Handful members' productions, although he was, curiously, very critical of the first production of Mussorgsky's Boris Godunov. Kiwi was influential enough as a critical voice that it was his roasting of Sergei Rachmaninov's first symphony that set about a near nervous breakdown in the younger composer. Kiwi wrote that, If there were a conservatory in hell, if one of its talented students were instructed to write a program symphony on the seven plagues of Egypt, and if he were to compose a symphony like Mr. Rachmaninoff's, then he would have fulfilled his task brilliantly and would delight the inhabitants of hell. Tchaikovsky was on at least friendly terms with the other members of the Mighty Handful, especially Balakidev, but in part due to Kiwi's criticism of his opera The Oprichnik and his first piano concerto, Tchaikovsky found him, quote, profoundly loathsome, and although he did acknowledge Kiwi's talent, he considered him a dilettante composer of coquettish music, whose work was not worth listening to beyond the first listening. Tchaikovsky had expressed early admiration for William Ratcliffe, but found Prisoner of the Caucasus to be paltry, naive, and worst of all, profoundly routine, which was surprising for a critic who often denounced routine in his writings. As if it wasn't clear, it wasn't Kiwi's music, it was his writings that have had far more impact on the history of Russian music than 
anything else. Not only were his publications a call to arms for the mighty handful and their followers against what they felt to be a Germanic intrusion, but it was his articles that were circulated elsewhere, especially in the aforementioned France and Belgium, promoting Russian music outside Russia. The French and the Russians have always had this strange I tend to call it a cultural bromance. The Russian nobility spoke French, and the French were obsessed with all things Russian and Eastern and exotic. While Kiwi's writings have not stood the test of time, for they're by no means objective, their presence helped shape awareness of nationalistic Russian music in Europe, helping sow the seeds for a society that would eventually welcome Diaklev's Ballet Russe and the groundbreaking scores of Igor Stravinsky.